Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, we are a small number today. That's a little different than we've had in the past, but I know that things are getting revved up and it's your first week back. So totally understand uh, why everybody is, is going in different directions. We, we understand that thoroughly. Um, but thank you for joining us and um, kudos to you for in diving into the new science program. And, and we're happy that you can join us on this journey. Um, we are here to unpack an organizing idea with you at a time. So hopefully you've had a chance to watch the first video. Don't panic if you didn't, you can still go back and watch it after this. It's just, we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the materials that were in the first video because we knew that would be stretched for time. So everything that we have today, we will try and share with you. You will have a slide deck, so you don't have to take screenshots and whatever because we'll be giving you everything that you need um, and we also know that you may or may not have started with living systems and maybe it's coming up after Christmas, like wherever you decided to teach it. So you always can go in to the website and pull up whatever materials you need when you need them. There is no rush. You're not going to expire. There's no time limit on this. You can go in and out whenever you need to. So feel free. If you feel comfortable turning on your computer your video that was great it's nice not to talk to a black box kind of like you probably didn't like to do when you were talking with your students in COVID times but we totally understand that that's not always the case either Lorraine I have to ask you are you related to Tim Fafard who's an administrator in Hinton uh, not that I'm aware of <laughs> okay all right just checking because it's not a name that you see very very often yeah. so i just wanted to know yeah, yeah. awesome yeah. great it could possibly be that's good to know thank you okay yeah for sure absolutely hi tracy nice to see you tracy you're a trooper three days in a row oh my god <laughs> you are right on the money okay so welcome everyone my name is chris arsky i'm with the cart consortium which is sort of central alberta and we're we're working with the entire province on science and i have a fantastic colleague that works with me and i'll let him introduce yourself himself Thanks, Chris. I'm Ted Zeroni. I'm with the Edmonton Regional Learning Consortium, the ERLC. I'm currently out of Sherwood Park right now on Treaty 6 territory. So having started at that point, we're going to start with our acknowledgement. And I'm going to do a little bit of a talk right after that, just to maybe connect it to the organizing idea that we're going to be looking at. So in the spirit of reconciliation, we want to acknowledge that this gathering takes place on traditional lands across the province of Alberta home to many diverse Indigenous, Métis and Inuit peoples. We acknowledge that this is a land of traditional meeting ground, giving voice to its original peoples and the story of creation of this country in a way that history has forgotten. And again, we're talking a little bit, uh, we're talking again into diving into how land and the relationships to land, which of course in Indigenous culture, that is a huge component of um, their culture and belief system that everything, Mother Earth, Father Sky, they are all connected. There's no entities that are separate. There's no item, no organism, no living being or inanimate object on Earth that is not related to life on Earth somehow, some way. And so uh, some of the pieces that we talk about would be Mother Earth and treating her with kindness and respect. Um, we often have ceremonies that you might have already been part of where you have a smudging or there's tobacco being used when there's um, a blessing of the water and, and so on. These are all parts of the traditions that go along with understanding the value and the respect and importance of Mother Earth. We're gonna talk a little bit about those and I've given you some links that you hopefully can use. You are all in different areas of the province. So again, you're going to have a different, a slightly different perspective you always have to acknowledge the area that you are in and what their belief systems are. There are lots that are very general and we can generalize, but you still have to be uh, knowledgeable about what, what area you're in and, and, where, and what their beliefs are. So uh, when we're done our series, and, and hopefully today you're gonna come away with some confidence that you feel like you've got a little bit of tools in your toolbox if you're just starting with this. Um, and that you're not unpacking this whole curriculum all in one shot, and it's not going to be perfect the first time around. You're going to find new resources as you go along, so feel free to um, acknowledge that you're just going to be handling things as they appear for you. 
giving you a bit of a sense of direction and that e efficacy that you have to sort of empower yourself to jump in and, and start wherever you feel comfortable. Certainly with kindergarten and grade one, there are lots of things that are very foundational and there are things that didn't change. But as we get into the older grades, there are some definitely some new, what we're calling the organizing ideas, no longer topics um, that come into play. So the norms that we introduced to you in session one was, so you know, we're, we're happy that you're here present if, if you can be with your videos on. If not, that's fine, we understand. Um, we've been doing a lot of the talking. Uh, and we're noticing that is just because we have such a time crunch to get through the materials we have. There's so little time for discussion and we would love to entertain discussion. Um, and if we wanna have another session, we can certainly do that. But just know that both Ted and I are available. If any time you need more resources or you have a question, do not hesitate to email us or phone us um, and we'll be glad to, um, to work with you and, and talk with you. And don't, don't feel that you, because we're talking that you can't unmute yourself and just jump in. Please share your expertise in the area. Some of you have been working in some of these topics for a long time. You've got lots of resources and if you're willing to share them, We'd like to start a common folder so that we can share those out with everybody that's in grade three. So looking at our chart that was created, we're looking and recognizing that living system started in grade one. It doesn't start in kindergarten uh, and it is moving all the way through grade six. And there is quite a noticeable progression in topics. So as I mentioned yesterday to some of the groups, if you're teaching a split grade this year, this is a bonus for you. It's one of those few times in your life that you can actually say, woohoo, the bonus, I get to teach a split grade because there are so many things that I can put together now, um, especially if you're talking about math as well. So that's the kind of uh, benefit we have in this first time round that the split grades will have some, some perks to them for sure. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Ted. <clears throat> He's gonna unpack a few pieces to you and, and talk about some things that are gonna be really relevant to the lesson pieces that I'm gonna talk about. All right, Perfect. Ted. Thanks, Thanks Chris. Um, as Chris mentioned, the organizing, organizing ideas, living systems, and in the first session that was recorded, kind of unpack the curriculum for you that way of how it's organized. But this is the living systems one, and um, in grade three, we are addressing a certain part of that, that um, big idea or that organizing idea, and that's um, that students analyze and then describe how plants and animals interact with each other in the environment. So the, organize, the organizing idea is big and grade three, we're taking a little chunk of that big understanding and looking at it. Um, now, in order to address that um, learning, outcome, learning outcome, and that's the one that we do have to report on uh, to parents, um, but we, we get information and assess where kids are at on that learning outcome by seeing how they're doing and working towards the knowledge, understanding, and skills and procedures parts. So they all work together in combination to help develop um, and meet that goal um, of students understanding how plants and animals interact with each other in the environment. As you go through the curriculum guide, we mentioned this in our um, um, first session as well, but just want to review one more time with you that there's some key words you may come across in the curriculum guide. <clears throat> Excuse me, curriculum guide as you read it. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, those are the highlighted words there. Include, um, sorry, words that are include, and words such as such as should be as not such a, and then words in parentheses. Include does mean whatever comes after the word include needs to be taught. All right. Um, anything that comes after such as are just examples and they're there for you to use and they're there for you to use as many of them as you want or in, and to include other examples as you see fit. And if there is a word in parentheses and there aren't many in grade three, um, it's a word that um, students do need to know but it could be interchanged as your as your um, instruction goes on with the word that maybe make more sense. So in this case, applied is the word we do want students to know, but um, it means the same as putting a, or exerting a force on someone or something by another object. And those are the key things. We're not going to be going through this every time, but just wanted to bring it up for you one more time so that when you do come across that as you go through the curriculum, you'll understand uh, what those words actually mean. Um, before we really go on and just a little further, I just want to pause a little bit because um, I think we have to just look at the big picture 
Um, we're in a world of, of huge rapid change, we know that. Um, the future is highly unpredictable. We know that's even more so. And it reminds me just briefly a little story of one of the very first workshops I went, went on as a rookie teacher. And it was still one of the most impactful ones because what the presenter was doing was, was what we hope to do today is, is share with you some powerful tools of how we can get students ready for this ever-changing and unpredictable future. The presenter at that time told a story, said he was talking to a brain surgeon and he was gloating to the brain surgeon of how amazing the work of a teacher is. That we can take a group of students with so many different backgrounds, so many different needs, and take a piece of paper called the curriculum and say, okay, we're going to, at the end of the day, have everybody have the same outcome. And the brain surgeon said, well, <laughs> no, of course not. And the question then went on, well, as a brain surgeon, how many variables can you control when that, when that um, person's in, um, having surgery? And basically every variable, heart rate, blood pressure, all these things can be controlled. And you, as we as educators, we come in, we have a, an outcome to do, to get to, and we can have very little control over many of those variables. So I just wanna pass out a, a, a just amazing work that you as teachers do to, to make that miracle happen every day. But just to remind that we have tools to help us along the way, just as a brain surgeon or a carpenter or anyone does. And what we hope to do as we go through today's session is help unpack and maybe make visible some of the tools you already have and maybe open your eyes to some new tools so you can put in your toolbox so that really at the end of the day, we can move our students forward to this really, really rapidly changing world. And if we go to the next slide, one of the things that, that we did mention, and you'll see in the, in the um, Learn Alberta, and the competencies are there, we need to include them in our learning and teaching, as long with literacy and numeracy progressions. But at the end of the day, no matter what curriculum we have, what is gonna make the difference is how we teach whatever it is. And we, that's where we choose teaching strategies that are going to include the competencies and help kids become literate in whatever subject they're working with and to use those numeracy skills and embed them whenever we can. Without doing those things, our curriculum and our teaching becomes a checklist and we won't be doing what we really all hope to be doing. And that's getting ready, um, getting our students ready for, for a really, really challenging world that seems to be unfolding before our eyes. So, um, Let's move on and see how we can unpack this thing and then fill that toolbox up a little bit. We did refer to the conceptual lens in their opening session. Um, and what I'd like to do is take a look at the curriculum from this lens first. I remember that a concept is just an organizing idea of one or two words. Uh, it's got certain qualities or attributes that make it what it is and there are examples. Uh, that um, can that meet that concept. Uh, for example, chair has a certain definition, and uh, there are many examples of different types of chairs that we would categorize or call a chair. So let's take a look through the curriculum through that lens first of all. And what I did was I took uh, the, actually the very first row. And that's why you'll see the the numbered outcome three life skills uh, outcome one, row one. Um, and I'd like you to take a look at that and look at it through the lens of the concept. What, what comes out of you as the key concepts in not only the learning outcome, but the knowledge, related understanding and related skills and procedures. I'll just give you a moment to look at it and see if you can, things can, are popping up at you. Feel free to, if you want, you can pop things into the chat box if you want. There's only five of us here, but that you're, you're, if you feel like doing that, go ahead. If you have your numbered outcomes, you can also circle them right on the document if you'd like. For sure. So if we go to the next slide, what we've done was highlighted those words that are concepts. And just by looking at how often they appear and where they appear, you really get a good sense about what's, what are the important ideas or concepts that the kids need to know in that part of the curriculum. And you'll see, the, and when you take a look at the other um, understandings and other 
cuffs, you'll see them show on and on. So first of all, the ones that I've identified here are the ones that are those nouns that we typically see. So food chain, uh, plants, animals, food, uh, diagram, illustration, and plants, animals, food chain certainly come up a lot. So those you know are the key ones that we're gonna need to know. Um, and plants and animals have been looked at through grade one and grade two and now grade three. So kids are pretty comfortable with that. Um, but food change is something that's gonna be new as well. Um, but embedded in the concept, or in just the regular concepts that we see, there are some other words that are relate to concepts. And we'll I'll talk about skills a little bit more later on, but I want you to take a pause and take a look at, at what happens when we take a look at skill related concepts. Um, I'm going to start on the, uh, maybe on the, on the left. So animals depend on each other for food. Well, the concept embedded with that is dependence. What is dependence? And then can we see an example of dependence when an, between animals and, and, and each other, right? And animals and plants and animals and humans. Is there a dependence there? What is it? Same with represented. Represented is a verb. A food chain can be represented through whatever. But what is a representation? And there are some good examples of representation right there. Uh, representation is pretty broad, but illustration, diagram, story, words, um, a, a play, a, a, a slideshow, those are all different representations of something. And so you'll see their interaction is another one that shows up. They don't use interaction, but uh, the way animals and plants interact Interaction is an important idea, and we can see examples of interaction not only between plants and animals, but interaction between characters in our language arts, uh, interactions between uh, each other in phys ed. And so it's another, it's a concept that comes up. So it's, it's worth probably taking a look and making sure that the kids understand those words and those concepts. I'll come back to that in a bit. Um, but as you can see, then, as I kind of alluded to, all the concepts themselves are arranged uh, in concepts themselves are broad to specific. And the next slide kind of shows that. Um, we have, we know that, for example, in this uh, life skills at grade three or life, um, life systems unit here in grade three, animals fairly broad. Uh, herbivore is a bit more specific. And then we can get to deer, which is uh, really a, a, an example, right? We get really specific. Um, and, but we you know there are different kinds of deer, right? Uh, there's a mule deer, there's a white-tailed deer. Um, those are the only two that I'm familiar with, uh, but an antelope is not a deer. And so there's some characteristics that make an antelope an antelope, right? Uh, next slide. Um, what I did here, and you have access to that in, in a planning guide that I'll give you, is they've taken all of the sort of the big idea, key concepts, and they mainly show up in the understandings part of, of, uh, of this particular organizing idea. Um, you'll see them show up in a lot of the understandings and a lot of the cusp, but that's where I really pulled them from. There are a few that I pulled from the knowledge piece, just to add in there a little bit to make it map a little bit more complete. Uh, but that's there for you to maybe go back to. Maybe you can get kids tinkering with that once you're done the organizing idea and see if they can organize things in a certain way. But it's a nice quick look at how things are all interconnected um, with the ideas and not just a list of ideas. It's actually a very fluid um, relationship between all the ideas in the, um, in the, in the guide there. Next slide. Um, and so keeping in, the, in mind of the conceptual lens, hopefully by the time we're done this uh, big idea, you can give students a pictures like this. And this is one of those nice transfer kind of things and just say, okay, here's a picture here. Look at it through the lens or what do you see any of the science, science concepts that we looked at? Do you see anything that we learned about that's an example in this picture? You might come up with plants, animals. Um, is there a human example of human behavior here? No, but historically we know there could be, or there could, there's a fence in the background. So we can give them either the lens to look at, or we can not give them a lens and say, what lens are you looking this picture through? And uh, you can see some interesting ideas come up that way. So we've taken a look at the, um, at the curriculum through the lens of concepts, but let's change a little bit and take a look at the lens through the skills and procedures. And as we know, skills and procedures are the doing things or the verbs and the action can be a uh, thinking or it can be an action, such as if you're conducting an investigation, there are certain things you do. If you're demonstrating respect, 
there's certain action or so on. So let's just take a look now at the curriculum uh, or at this big idea or organizing idea through the lens of skills. And I've taken all the all the um, uh, this, all the uh, items from the skills and procedures and identify them here. And I've highlighted the word that, that's that verb. Um, we've seen represent before, and we've got identify, discuss, and so on. And so those are all the things that kids do. And they do end up at the day, when you stop and look at them, they could be really good assessment tools or assessment questions, right? Though, Because if we want, kids need to be able to, for example, to discuss how plants and animals respond to stimuli to that. They need to know it, then they have to discuss it, or they have to identify these things. Um, but I just want to throw a word of caution, not caution, but maybe just a little, a few little tips when we're looking at the skills and procedures part. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, I, my first tip is that clarify in your mind what the skill is when you're reading those, not just for this uh, outcome, or even if you're doing other, some of your other um, programs as well, looking at that word, making sure you know what it is and making sure it's actual, an actual doing verb, uh, get that clear because sometimes the verb looks like it's a verb, but it's actually asking or thinking thing, but it's actually getting kids to do the same thing over and over. And it's really to state. All right. And I'll show you what I mean in the next slide. So when you're stating something, you're just expressing what you know, and you could state it in different ways. So if you take a look at the middle um, um, skill and procedure outcome there, uh, the word identifies they're used to in this context, identify where fossilized dinosaur bones are on display in Alberta, and that comes out of the grade three um, uh, earth systems. And then that word identify is used again in the living si systems, identify carnivores, herbivores, and omnivores in a food chain. When you stop and think about it, if you give pictures, kids the pictures of a food chain, and they were to identify which is the, the herbivore, the carnivore, and it's something they've never seen before, they should be able to identify those things. Now, they're not memorizing and identifying, stating, well, I know that that's a bear, so I know it's an omnivore. It's using the evidence. So really, in a sense, what they're doing is classifying the, the animals based on what they see uh, and the way it's used in the food chain. Whereas the identifying earth systems is really just not to class, it's sort of where are they located? Do you know that? Yes, they're on display here and here. Now, you can see how there's another uh, skill procedure. This is from grade three matter. They do use the word classify there. And if we take that word classify and interchange it with the word identify up top, we could see they would work. So classify changes to materials as permanent or reversible. If we use classify, we could say at the very top one, classify carnivores, classify the animals as carnivores, herbivores, or omnivores in a food chain. So just keep that in mind as we go along. So when it comes to skills, though, oh, there's another tip, though. <laughs> um, when you come across those, um, those skills procedures, again, clarify your intention. All right, because really there's, when you're gonna use a skill, there's a skill part and a knowledge part and decide which one you're really working on. If the intent is to assess the skill, can kids class, classify? I suggest me use content with which their kids are not responsible or not familiar, all right? Um, because they're not responsible for, maybe you shouldn't say not familiar, but not responsible for. So that the focus is on, the skill and not competing with the knowledge part itself. On the flip side, if your intent is to assess the knowledge associated with that, make sure that they're competent in the skill. And by grade three, when you look at all the way through, they may be very well competent with classifying, but we're not too sure. So what I wanna do with you next is so if we have a skill and we're not too sure, how can we teach a skill to make sure they're competent in it before we send them off to deal with content that they're actually responsible for knowing uh, in the assessment portion. So what I often use, there's different ways to teach skills, but I, I, what I use is something called a direct teaching strategy. I like teaching a skill directly, but there's more than one way to do it. So on the next slide, Chris. 
Um, oh, I guess I moved ahead a little bit. That's just the same point uh, that I brought up earlier. Instruct your intention if it's to, to instruct, if it's to, um, in this particular case, if it's to classify, maybe give them something else before you use this um, outcome or this, um, this cusp of identifying classifying carnivores, herbivores, and omnivores in the food chain. So if we're if you're not too sure if the kids know how to classify, a good thing is to give the give them an, an activity and classify if they can, then you're good to go. But what I do is back up a little bit and say, I don't, let's say my kids really don't know. And I say classify, they don't know what that means. They may know what it how to do it, but I want to make sure they connect the word classify because it's something that's going to show up a lot in their in their schooling. Classify this, classify that classify these characters in language arts, um, classify these, uh, these healthy foods in, in health, RP, and wellness. So let's just stop and take a look at classify for a minute. And I'll go through an example of how you may want to unpack it and, and teach it um, directly to students so that there's no <laughs> and for about what they're learning. Next slide, please, Chris. And there's a link to that. Um, so in a direct instruction approach, there are, are a lot of steps, but if you can go over that, we're on the last slide, actually, <laughs> I, I probably uh, had it. There you go. I want to go. Where do you want to start? Uh, right, right there. Example, I'll classify. Okay. And a skills teaching strategy with a whole lot of steps. Uh, and the first few steps are, are kind of there for you to follow, not for the kids to follow. So let's just, uh, I have comparing cost testing outside that's wrong to be classifying. So let's just move on to classifying. Um, the first thing to do is define the skill. And there it is. Uh, what does classify mean? I struggled with this um, because there's all kinds of, of uh, <laughs> um, definitions. I chose on this one based on how I know what kids are doing in this, in this guide and other guides to arrange a group of people or things in a class, I call it or group based on the shared characteristics of that class. That's step one. Make sure you understand the definitions because you want the kids to be able to really restate that definition as well at some point. Um, this is the hard part, really. When you classify, what is it that you do when you classify? And that's the part with this uh, teaching strategy that I think is one of the harder things, but one of the most powerful things. If you can break down what you do into steps, then it's easier to help the students out. Just like uh, how if you are a phys ed teacher or coached anything, you know that, for example, if you want to teach a student how to throw a basketball, uh, you go through some steps. You do this with your arm, and you got the flicking of the wrist, and you've got the follow through. And so you do that with thinking as well. Sometimes our thinking happens so fast, we don't know what we do. So there's a bit of a metacognition thing here. Once you do that, uh, number go to number three and four, then you uh, identify the steps. Here's what I thought were the three, uh, the three key steps were, is that you look at the class or the group and identify the characteristic of that class. There may be more than one class to think about. An example then, omnivores is a, as a, as a class of, of, uh, of thing, is a class because it's got animals in it that have one thing in common, right? They eat animals and plants as an omnivore and so on. So a class has a characteristic that, that all the things under that class will have. And then you look carefully at the characteristics of the items you want to classify or put into those groups. And then you put them into the group that has the same characteristics. So it sounds fairly simple, but sometimes those are really good prompts when a kid really does get stuck because you won't know now by asking those questions, do they know what the characteristic of the class is, or are they familiar with the example they're trying to classify? If they've never seen a platypus, they may not know how to classify. Yeah. Um, and then once you do that, take a look at your steps and go to the next slide and determine what the kids may need to know in the steps in terms of understanding. In this particular case, the concepts I'm not too sure if they know would be class, I maybe want to introduce that. And I'm not using the word the biological class. I'm just talking like a, you know, that person belongs to class all to themselves, just the general idea of a group with something in common. Um, so they may not understand what that word is. So I'm going to introduce that to them. I know that maybe by from grade one and grade two, if I've been teaching this way, I know what they know, what characteristics are. We've talked about that. 
and they know what similarity is. So I'm not going to worry about that. So I'm going to worry about before I teach comparing con or come, it should be classifying. I'm sorry. I'll change that slide. Um, before I do that is to help them make sure understand they understand what class is. So now I go to teaching a concept, right? And we can do that. Um, one way I do that is a concept attainment. For example, there's a group of yeses. Um, there's a group of no's. When you stop and take a look, the things in the yes all have something in common. For example, and if the no's don't fit, we compare the top two. Why does the picture with the goose on the right not fit with the rest? What seems to be missing? They all have something in common. So where would you put that middle group? With the yeses or the no's? And after you know, some prodding and some thinking and maybe some group talk, we would put it with the yeses because they all have something clearly in common where the no's, they hard to tell what they have in common. And so we introduced the idea of class as a group of things that have something in common. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, anytime you do a concept attainment, you always do some tests and Chris is gonna show you lots of stuff that she does with her group sorts and pictures like that. And so we can see here are, you know, if, if these are two, these are two classes, what, what do they all have in common? Of course, on one side, the road and the other side, it's all winter. And you could ask them, well, hey, wait a minute, there's a, there's a picture um, in the bottom right that's a, it's a road rising with the roads, but it's also in the winter what's going on. And we can understand that things can belong, um, the, you know, you, your class depends on the characteristic that you're focusing on. Next uh, slide. And so there, now I'm set up. Now what I do then is share and model the steps to the class. So I've, I've, I've no way, I've really taught them what a concept, what, they, what a class is, and I know the steps. So here I go, uh, go ahead, next slide. Um, and uh, so I've gone through the steps and this would be something that I would model to them. So I now I have the, the question, classify these items as either hot or cold, but what do I do? First of all, look at my two categories, hot, things that have a high temperature, cold the things that have a low temperature. And then I see what attributes does that first picture have? That's the sun, that's something that's hot, it's hot. So it slows thinking down, but you end up modeling how they, how they, how they can classify. And that really at the end of the day is how I might introduce a skill, not necessarily classification, depending on how old the kids are and what they already know. But it's the, it's the steps that I think it's important that I really want to share with you. Like sometimes we move ahead and kids really don't know what they're really supposed to be doing. And if we use the same words, classify, class, and those kinds of things, anytime they see that word, you can say, you know, what is a good thing, you know, classify these things in a language arts class or classify these as, as, um, as nouns, then you now have something you can work on. And that transfer for that word and that whole process comes up again and again. So that's why I want to just go to the very last slide almost. Um, yeah, they, that, the one before it, sorry. This one? Uh, yeah, um, right there. So you, to really get kids to do anything with their thinking skill, you always want to give them as much practice as possible. It could be in language arts, like I said, it could be in math, it could be in social studies, where you just give them as many opportunities to classify when they can so they get used to that skill. And eventually you want to get them to really get a deep understanding of it. And you can even explore it at a conceptual level. You can throw something like this at them. Might be too tough at grade three, but later on, the next two slides. Uh, just, yeah, next slide. Really quick. Give them these words. I'd have a little piece of paper, cut them out. And then we'd ask them, how can you relate these words together, right? And you see that classify is in there and they would make connections with, it's a thinking thing. It's similar to compare and contrast. Uh, the, the compare and contrast and classify both have something to do with similarity and so on. So when they can arrange things like that, again, it's demonstrating their, they have a deeper understanding of that, of that skill because they can relate it to other ideas. And finally, the very last slide, um, so that's where you can get the deep thing, uh, not, that, not that far. <laughs> um, have learners reflect on what the skill is, talk about it, what was easy to classify, what was hard, or comparing contrast, or reflecting, or discussion, whatever your skill you're, you're focusing on. We need to take the time to talk about those skills and bring it up to the forefront so it becomes automated for them. In other words, 
we can they can transfer it. We always give them opportunities finally to make the make the situation where they're doing those skills more novel, more not more complicated, so that they do transfer that ability to classify or whatever the skill is. And finally, just one last point on my part. I'm looking at the time here. Um, I just want to point out one thing to you here before we go on. Yeah, we're back to the slide deck there. Okay. Um, yeah, you'll notice that um, you probably come across this a lot already, but just as a review, we know that through the learning process, kids need to have that basic solid foundation before they can move on. It's so important that we think about the knowledge part being unimportant. It's, it is important, knowledge is important. What is the thing? What is classify? What's, a, what's an omnivore? But then when we take it, we go deeper by connecting the ideas together, by practicing it in different ways to eventually transfer that information and those ideas and how they're connected is where we wanna go. We want a solid surface understanding. We don't wanna stop there. All right, it's, you could look at this curriculum and probably look at it and teach it away and stop there. But we know unless we go into deep modes and transfer modes that become good at understanding and using those ideas, we're not going to get to those things that we really know matter, uh, really know really matter when our kids leave here. And that's the you know, citizens and respectful and, and creative thinkers and critical thinkers, unless we give them those opportunities in our class. And we're going to not going to give them those opportunities unless we go through this process moving from surface into deep and into transfer. And there are, you, Chris is going to show you really soon here a lot of examples of how you do that. There's so many instructional approaches we have at our list. I showed you through two that I might use at the surface level, uh, but there are others that are you can Google or email Chris or myself that we can show you how to do these things and, and practice doing making some of these activities. And don't think you have to do everything all at once. Do one. <laughs> <laughs> do one on your own, try it with one subject, one course. Don't change everything you're doing because you got to get good. You got to try one little step at a time. And finally, um, this is um, some before we go on and let Chris show you what she's got. She's got a magic box full of, of great things to work with. Um, is that remember you have to be intentional. And when you're intentional about what you're doing, how you're teaching, what instructional strategy you're doing, what outcomes you're working on, then you're going to move up that ladder. And I'm providing a little document here for you. You can go on to the next slide, Chris. That might help with that. It's a planning document. On the new Alberta site, there are things called boards which can help you do that. This is one that might come in handy for you. Oh boy, why is that? Um, that's the wrong link on there, Chris. <laughs> oh, but the idea will be the same. Uh, yes and, and no. Um, yeah, it will be the same. It's actually a one pager now. Okay. So I can just run through just what's on there. So sure. this is a plan document for you guys. Sure. If you go to page the second tab at the bottom, it won't be filled in or anything. But at the end of the day, what that'll do, it'll be a bunch of drop down menus where you'll be able to quickly choose your organizing idea, link outcome. They're not there because they're not loaded up on this one. But you will be able to pick those out. You won't have to go anywhere. It'll be a one-stop kind of a place to get all those from whatever course or unit you're working on. Just scroll down. There'll be a list of all the competencies that you can choose. So just by clicking on the, uh, on, those would be, those would be filled. Uh, there'll be competencies for the grade level that you're working at or age group that you're working at that you can choose from to focus on. Um, and then if you go further down, all the key concepts that are in the unit, if you want to say, I'm going to be focusing on this one, you can choose one and provide the definition for it so you can get ready for your, your teaching. And because um, to do these things, you need to know the definition, the kids need to know the definition. And finally, skills and processes as well. So um, the one you're going to get access to is actually a one pager. Uh, and it's a little bit easier to use and more compact, and it's directly filled with things that you need for, for grade three. If you like planning that way, that's there for you. Um, everybody has their own way to plan, but that's one thing that you can use if you so wish. And, time and that tool is awesome. It, it just, it's a time saver. I love it. It's just great. I just want to go back to this slide here. Some of you might have seen I put into the chat box. Um, Project Zero. If you're not familiar with these types of activities, 
they come from Hattie as well in, in his engagement and, and his strategies for teaching, but Project Zero has very similar title. They use the same ones, but what they'll do is they'll actually explain it to you. You can have a little card and it will actually say, you might wanna use this in this age group with this kind of activity. So if you aren't familiar with these, you can go there, look up a couple of them and say, hey, you know, this actually fits with what I'm gonna be doing. So I'm gonna try that. But as Ted said, you don't want to go crazy on these either. Like you don't want to do a different one every day because kids have to learn them. They have to know what it is that you're doing. And you have to find some that fit to your teaching style. I love them, but I also tried, I probably tried 30 of them already, but not everything fits my teaching style. I mean, there's some I walked away from at the end of the week and said, never again, I'm not going that one again. It just doesn't work for me. But you have to find what works for you, where you want to go, and they're very engaging. So when we talk about engaging students, there you go. You're going to get a teaching tool, you're going to get them engaged, and they're going to learn, and they don't even know they're learning. It's, it's a fantastic little place to go. Okay, so I changed it up a little bit. So I didn't want poor Tracy, who's been with me all week here. I didn't want her to see the same kind of screen every day. So I used sort of a concept map on a web to look at what we're going to do to unpack. And the one thing that I'm, I'm really seeing very strongly, um, again, those of you who are teaching split grades have that ability now to really combine things. Um, but there's lots of places here. And this curriculum, and we haven't said that before, but we probably should have, is the curriculum is not designed to be taught in the order that it's presented. It, there was never any intent for you to do the first row, second row, third. That is not the intent at all. And so when it comes to grade three, absolutely, it would be better not to teach it in the order that it's in um, and to do some combining. So uh, also it has the opportunity again to put the kids up front and let them be some of the teaching teachers in this situation, as opposed to um, the stand up and delivery mode of, as Ted said, you know, I can define it for them, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to understand the concept. And I'm not a stand up and delivery person. I am a very hands on, get the kids going and then tease out of them what they know. And if I need to fill in some gaps, I will, but I really want them to come to some understandings as they go along. So just in sort of a short summary of this, I'm gonna start off with first of all, finding out if they even know anything about Alberta animals, because that is part of their, um, one of their skill sets is, are they able to identify plants and animals native to Alberta? And so I've created a card sort for you. It's an, ex an expanded one for the grade one, two teachers. It's a different, it's the same, but with more added on. Um, and we wanna know, first of all, do they even know the difference between plants and animals? And then what do they know about Alberta animals? I picked Alberta plants and animals that may be common to some students, depending on where they live in the province. And others, they may say, I, I don't know. If I'm not a farm student and I've never been on a farm, a cow is a pretty foreign thing to me. But if you live in a country setting and you're in rural Alberta, a cow is not a foreign thing to you, right? So it's the comfort level of each child is going to be very different. So first of all, just getting to know, and then we'll move into food chains and food webs using the cards, right? We just always want to revisit what we've already done uh, and talking about the classifying and using that approach that, that Ted has already unpacked for you. We're looking at where do they live? Where do they live? Where do the children live? Where are you coming from? Are you a forest? Are you a mountain community? Are you a plains community? Like, where are you at? And that will help determine a little bit too about what they know about the animals around them. It doesn't mean that they shouldn't learn the other ones, but we want them to know different locations that animals might live in. And I might struggle. If I'm a mountain kid and I've never been on a farm, I'm gonna have a tough time answering some questions, vice versa, right? Um, and then looking at the diversity of how do animals adapt to those types of scenarios? Like how do animals use their senses? How do plants use their senses? Kids will say they don't even have senses. And the answer is yes, they do. Then how do they know to close their flowers at night when it cools off? And how do they know to open them and how they respond to temperature? How does a mole or a vole know that there's a, an earthworm seven inches away from him? We couldn't hear that. We'd have to go dig for them, but they know exactly where they are. So that's the kind of thing we want to unpack down here is that interconnectedness. And, and I need to use my stimulus senses that I have all around me, whether it's the water that I'm living in, whether it's in the land that I'm working, that I'm my house is in, or that I'm going to be um, using for food. I need to be able to use those pieces and senses. 
And then looking at the interconnectedness again is that ecological footprint. It's a little bit of an extension really of what grade two has already done where they talk about the four R's and this really ties into it again. So again, if you're teaching a two, three split, you got it made because you could just do this all together. So I'm gonna share uh, this with you right now. I'm gonna go into a slide deck for those who are new to this process. I will share this entire slide deck with you. So you don't have to panic and scramble to, to write things down, you'll have it all. So I, I combined a bunch of things that I had already used in the classroom and then went and just found a few that, that I had in, in storage as well. So we're looking at really the guiding question of how do plants and animals interact, right? That's, that's our guiding question. That's what we have to answer in order to unpack this particular organizing idea. And we're looking at how students can analyze and describe how plants and animals interact with each other, whether it's in a food chain, whether it's in how they survive, whether it's in where they live. So you have access to this. Uh, and I gave you a copy in your file folder and I'll talk about all of the where to find it at the end. So we're gonna start with, and you'll see that I'm using um, the uh, living systems 1.1, 1.2 and 1.5. Because in 1.5, they're saying still children should know plants and animals that are native to Alberta. Well, what a better place to do that is if I know what's in Alberta and I can figure out what I have, then I can use that for my food chains and for my food webs. So these are simply suggestions, right? This slide deck is not the end all be all, but it's a very fast sort of half an hour of view of what you could think about maybe grabbing ideas from. So you might want to start with what do you do when you get hungry? How do you decide what you're going to eat? And, and I just put in brackets, you know, they might say, well, I've got allergies, I can't eat this, I go to the fridge, it might be what's available at home, it's what I like for snacks, it's what I don't like, like all the different things that, that inter just come to mind right away about what is it I want to have? How do I make the decision? How do you think animals make the decision, right? We untease all of those things that they talk about when they want to go and get something to eat. Now let's flip it. How do you think animals make that decision? So again, they're hungry. How do they decide what they're gonna go eat? And, and it might be depending on size. My mouth is only so big. I can only eat so much. I, I can only eat meat. I don't eat meat. I only eat grass. I don't eat grass, right? I would see a cat chasing something to go and eat it. I don't think I'm gonna see a cat chase a pig because it's too big for them. But we need to ask that question to make sure that that concept makes sense to them that when I'm making the decisions about when an animal goes and makes choices. So what kinds of things would they eat? Typically, what kinds of things would be available to them? Having that conversation, what's in our surrounding where we live? We see lots of robins. What else do you see? Lots of bugs. Do they like bugs? Yeah, that's a good conversation to have. We haven't done anything yet. All we've done is talk about the world we live in in our location. And, and maybe have a look at what we know and don't know about the animals. So I've provided you with a card sort. I've, I've expanded them to 40, I think there's 45 or 46 now. And they have numbers at the bottom for those who um, have, this is new to you. There's a number at the bottom and I give you a cheat sheet that tells you what each one of those pictures is. So in case you get an animal on there and it's native to Alberta and you say, I have no idea what this is. So you've got the answer key, so that's not a problem. So what we wanna do is just find out. Let's just give them in teams of two or three, give them a pack of cards and say to them, can you sort the cards based on what the animal's name is or the plant's name is? Like, I know this is a bear. I know this is a deer. I know this is, I don't know what this is. Put it over here. I don't know what it is. Okay, I know this plant, this plant's alfalfa. Okay, the kids around the farm will know that. It's kids in the city might not know that. So I have a, I know this pile, I don't know this pile. And then you might wanna go and have them just do a quick walk. I'm not gonna tell them the answers right off the bat. I'm gonna to say to them, go and talk to another group and take your piles with you and just compare. You know, Which ones did you guys know? Which ones didn't you know? Maybe you guys can help each other out and figure out what you did know or not. And then in the end, we can have a discussion, You know, put them up on the screen and say, are there any here that nobody knew? Is there anyone up here that nobody had an answer to? And then we have that conversation just so that they have a name for an animal. They may not know a lot about the animal yet, and that's okay. And I'm not gonna give them that answer. So we're gonna ask them to resort them in just a moment. Now that I know what they are, and that might take me a whole day just to talk about the animals that are in Alberta. What do I know about those animals? So I'm gonna have four different groups and you could cut these off and use them as, as header cards if you wanted. 
I know the name of the animal and I know what it eats. Okay, I'm totally familiar with a cow. Um, I know the name of the animal, not exactly sure what it eats. I don't know the name of the animal, but looking at it, big hunky cat, I'm gonna take a guess that I think I know what it eats or don't know the animal and don't have a clue what it eats, right? This is formative for us because if, if I'm gonna meet those outcomes and I want them to start getting into food chains, they better have an understanding of what these animals actually eat and, and where they might eat each other is where we're going. So I'm gonna do that card sort. And again, I might have a conversation or maybe I'm gonna go around to the groups and say, what, where did you put in these piles? Talk to me about what you saw. Maybe have them group with another group. What did you guys not answer? What Feed each other some information and see what you come up with. So having that strong framework of understanding and the more they see the cards, the more they start to know the names, the more they start to see the animal. Oh yeah, I got those blue jays, they're in our backyard, blah, 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 right? Then I can start moving into where I wanna go. And that might be, I'm gonna show them an example. I show them that when I talk about a food chain, I might be talking about eat or be eaten, right? And that's a fact of life. We are on this earth to either sustain something or to be eaten by something. And that is the way the world works in the world of, of animals and humans are animals as well. So I gave them an example saying, here's some grass. The hare eats the grass and the owl eats the hare. So there's lots of energy that came from the grass and the energy that it has goes into the rabbit when the rabbit eats it. They lose some obviously because they're not going to digest 100% of it and get the full amount. And then an owl eats my hair, and the same thing is true. So the flow of energy goes from the lowest level, plant, to whatever we've identified as our top level. This is my food chain. Now I've got 44 cards, so I got a lot of possibilities there. So now is our chance to have a conversation about. So you kind of know some of the ones of who you thought, what they eat. Could you find three different food chains? So take your cards and you might even want to sort the cards about these are plants and these are animals, right? You, that's up to them. Let them muck through that. I'm not gonna give them suggestions. I will in a minute, but I'm not gonna tell them that now. I'm just gonna say, can you come up with three different food chains? And then do a gallery walk. Just see what they have. There's unlimited different combinations they can come up with. And one of the first questions that we got asked was, is it always gonna be three? No, here's your challenge. Can you make one that's longer than four? Can you make one that's two? Can you like see if you can make different lengths, right? So that they're understanding that it's not always three items in a row that are going to give me a food chain. And it's important for them to understand that it could be different level because the food chain is very limited, right? It's only, I got to start here, I got something in here, I got something in here, and then it's gonna end somewhere. So I, I don't have unlimited amounts of directional flow. So when we talk about a food chain, we have three sort of different levels that we can talk about. We can have what we introduce to them as the producers, the consumers, and the decomponing. So there is a time where I'm gonna have some factual information and some instruction. I can't get away from that. So the producers are those greens. It's the part that uses sun energy in order to make its own food. Plants make their own food and that we don't have to get into photosynthesis and whatever, I'll just leave that for now, but they need to know that they need sunlight. They need sunlight to grow. I don't need sunlight. I can stand out in the sun all I want, I'll get sunburned, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna get any food out of it, right? So we need to make those connections for them. So producers are always at the bottom, but they are the highest amount of energy. They get the most energy that anybody could ever have. When we look at consumers, they're the people who are taking. I need that energy. I need the food from them. So they might be hunting. They might be just grazing, right? We're going to talk about that in a minute. But consumers take. They need to go and get. If I consume my supper, I'm eating my supper. And so that's a good way for them to think about it. I do introduce decomposers to them because things die. Right? And we already talked about that in grade two, that we have a life cycle and things will die and then they come back again. So we have a seed, the plant dies, the seed is in the ground, we go through the whole cycle again. So it's important for them to know that when things die, what happens then? And there are 
ways that we break down things that die and we use those for the things that are living again over and over and over again there's a cycle that goes through it and i did include earthworms in their pictures so they should be able to find that as they go along when we talk about who consumes we also want to break that down into the three categories right so we want to be able to classify this is where we're going to go we want them to know that herbivores are the green eaters. They're not the meat eaters. The carnivores are the meat eaters. And there are some that will only eat meat. They are not interested in greenery of any kind. And then we have those who will take whatever's available, right? They may have a preference of one if they're given a choice, but they'll eat both, plant and animal. So when I talk about herbivores, I can give them examples. And in their card sort, they have rabbits, squirrels, and deers. They don't have grasshoppers, right? This is new. And they'll probably realize that when they start going through that there are some animals that they see every day that aren't even in their list. And we'll address that in a minute. I did that on purpose. Okay, examples of carnivores that they might be familiar with. Hawks, hawks will go down and eat another animal. Okay, um, a wolf will go and search out another animal to eat. So they are meat eaters. You don't see hawks going and eating grass. Okay, that, that's not in their in their area. Bears, on the other hand, will eat whatever is available. They prefer greenery, especially berries, bear berries. They prefer having high protein kinds of, of roots but, and dandelions, but they'll definitely eat meat if they're given the opportunity. And if I'm a grizzly, I definitely want meat. So they have the opportunity to eat, live in both worlds. And then our decomposers are those microorganisms they're in the ground, they're the, um, they break things down. We've got earthworms, they break things into smaller parts. And again, we're starting to go through and work those. So a food chain is a very simple way for us to show what that flow of energy is, right? That the sun gives the plants, gives to an animal, gives to another animal, gives to another animal, gives to another animal, gives to another animal, okay? Or the other way around, whichever way we're gonna go. So when I'm talking about this we're just trying to give them an understanding and we want to clarify for them and maybe you want to ask for an oral can you give me an example of a producer in your card sort just hold one up can you give me a consumer hold one up right you just want to make sure that that's clear but we're going to tease that out even further when we talk about when you made those three food chains were those the only three that we could have made? And if they did a gallery walk, then the answer is an obvious no, because they would have seen other things. It isn't always linear, and that's very limiting. And in the wild, that's not how it works. We see lots of different animals eating lots of different animals. We see lots of different animals eating plants. So several food chains linked together give us a better real reality of where the world is at. We're into the food web. And if they think of a spider web, what do I see? I see lots of connections going back and forth. And that's exactly what a food web was. It takes a number of different possible uh, food chains and lines them together. So in this case, how many could they come up with? And this would be one I would do with them orally because we are gonna ask them to go back to their card sort here right away. So I'm looking at this and I would actually ask them to tell me verbally. And then I would actually ask them to write it down. I'm going from a mouse arrow to a hawk, right? The energy from the mouse goes to the hawk. I have a flower which goes to a mouse, which goes to a hawk and so on. Because writing representing both in words and in written form is part of the approach and part of the skills that they need to be able to do. So let's take our cards back out again. They're familiar with them. First thing I'd ask them to do is maybe can we just sort them? Let's sort them into the three different areas that we want. So producers, consumers, and de decomposers. Because we're gonna ask them to make a food web. And if I have them in the different groups, it's gonna be really easy for me to start grabbing from what er every area that I want. And then once I've got them sorted, maybe I even wanna take my consumers and sort them one more time and sort them into smaller piles of herbivores, carnivores, or omnivores. So that when I start building my big web, that I have an opportunity to have different choices that I can put in there. Describe at least three food chains once they're done. So we did do this actually last year with a group of students and we just gave them huge poster paper on the floor, the 
kind that just rolls off and we just said, have at her, take your cards, lay them out. And then they put their cards down and then they use their uh, markers just to do the arrow right on there because we can reshuffle the cards obviously later on. But then they can also see where their three food chains are. But what they also saw was that not everybody started in the same place. Not everybody put the same animal in the same place eating the same things. So it just gave them lots of different perspectives. So one of the things that we said in your gallery walk, go find another food chain represented by somebody else's food web. And it actually became a challenge to see how many, how many cards could they use in their food web. It's not maybe going to be where how they set it up and how they put it. They may not get all of their cards used. So that was their challenge. And then we had some kids that were just bound and determined that they were going to use every card that they had. So the idea is that we really want to make sure that they understand the flow of energy is always from the highest energy level of plants moving its way up. Okay, how do plants and animals use their senses? So now I've got these plants, I've got these animals. I know how they kind of sustain themselves and how they eat. The question is, how do they even know what they're gonna eat? So how do I, how do I bring them together into the world of where I live? And again, you may use lots of these, you may only use a couple. I would use a case study approach, that's my personal preference when I have lots of options that I can choose from because now I can make the kids the teacher as well. It's not me standing and delivering. So in a case study approach, we can say, do animals have senses? And we can review what are the senses that we have, right? Let's talk about the senses, but do animals have senses? And if they do, what might they be? And then we could say, we're gonna have a group that's gonna look at hearing, right? We're gonna have a group that looks at smell. We're gonna have a look, group that looks at eyes. And how do animals have those extra special senses enhanced over us? What do they do? What are they capable of? And then what about plants? A lot of people just think of plants, you just throw it in the ground, it grows and that's it. There's nothing else happening to it, but it definitely has senses as well. So making a group responsible for unpacking the knowledge of a plant senses. I'm gonna do the one that has taste. They, they, plants don't even have a mouth, but they still have taste, right? So how do they describe that? So we could do that, but at the same time, and this is probably gonna go off here right away. Yeah. Which animal has... Go back one. I may also want to tie this in at the same time with the group that talks about the different places in Alberta that they could be finding some of these plants. You could do all four of them. You don't have to, because it's a such as, but it's nice to see the diversity that they understand, or you simply limit it to the area that you live in. If you live in a boreal forest area, if you live in a prairie area, like where, where you live would be kind of the area that you might want to focus on. But if we want to expand it, then I can tie in both what the animals use their senses for and where they live to where could they live? Where are the places that bears live? They don't live in downtown Edmonton, although they have in the past and could, I guess, in the future, um, if the water keeps staying the way it is. Um, but, but we see animals migrate, right? They move. And how do they move? And how do we know that the food is there? When you get to lakes and rivers, this is a fun one. I just put a link in here for you. Again, these are just suggestions, not that you have to use it. But if you wanted to do lakes and rivers, because again, it's endless, depending on where you live, you have different animals. Not everybody in Edmonton would have an otter floating around in their water, right? But some of you live in different places that you would. So this particular site takes them through the water world, but it does it in a bingo form. And it's a lot of fun. So you might want to just dabble with that anyway, just to have a bit of a break and, and to do something different with them. I also put at the bottom here, the anatomy of a boreal forest, because a lot of us are in a boreal forest area. So that would be something else that we could look at. What do we typically see in that kind of an area? And then a boreal forest hinterlands. Those used to be on television, but they're nice short little video clips and, and information pieces that you can have. Again, you're gonna get all these links. You don't have to worry about it. You're gonna get all of this stuff sent to you. So the transfer, once I've gone through this, and that would take us a while, right? That's going to take us a good week, if not more, when they're working on it and doing some reporting. We're going to share how could we compare and contrast? What did we find out about the animals and the plant senses? And are there some similarities and differences between them? Are they completely different? Um, we might want to look at where do we live? We might want to, if we did all the different places, we might want to say, where do we live? We live in a burial first? Okay. 
So can you describe some plants and animals that are not in your card sort? What are some things that we left out? Um, when we did the card sort and the web, we also gave them permission to make up their own cards and they just had to write the name on them. So if they were missing an animal and they really wanted it in their food web, we said, knock yourself out, put one on a card and stick it in there. But now we're saying pick some that are not in picture form and you could either create your own, the, how you want them to um, identify this and display it to you, whether it's a representation, whether it's going to be um, a communication piece where they're writing something for you. Um, but really what we want them to do is now dig a little deeper to wherever they live. Can they come up with other animals that fit into all the categories that we've just talked about? And those animals, what senses are they gonna use based on where they're living? So we're kind of combining a lot of pieces together. At the end, you'll see I say, how healthy is your plant and animal environment? So this goes a little bit from grade two, and you might want to even do the whole transfer activity at the end of our unit, as opposed to right here, because we're gonna do a little bit more talking about how do we help to ensure that plants and animals are safe and that their health is ensured in the areas that we live in. So you might want to, and I've got to spell out typo in there, um, you might want to have a look at that right away and, and say, okay, we're going to do that separately, or I'm just going to leave this all until the end and we tie the whole piece together. So that's what this sort of big piece is now. We're going to look at how do we even meet the needs of animals in Alberta. Okay, we're not talking about the whole world. We're just talking about Alberta. And I've taken a few slides from yesterday as well to just prompt their thinking, because for those of you who are teaching solely in grade three, remember there are things that they might not have seen coming to you in grade three. So we have to be able to do some bridging. I've included some slides. If you don't think they need them, just ignore them. Um, but again, just showing them this picture and what do you wonder? You know, it might be, why are they picketing? Why are they saying, don't cut down my trees? Um, providing two different stories that you could read if you have them. The earth book is one that's common in schools. Um, why should I protect nature is a, is a pretty common book as well. But then I've just given this Venn diagram. How do I compare what I learned in the first book to what I learned in the second book? What was common and what was different? What did they present to us? Because those are foundational pieces for me, keeping my environment around my world safe. How am I gonna take what I learned in these books and apply it? If you wanna do a reading for yourself and then have one read to them, the Earth Book is an, also an audio version that you can have. Talking about this symbol, right? If we're talking about keeping everything safe and healthy and what are we doing to promote it? Do we remember the recycle? And what are some things that harm our Earth? What are some things that help to fix our Earth? So some of this is grade two, but it really ties so much into what you're doing in grade three again. So on this one, One Earth, this one is really starts off with just garbage and destruction and all the bad things that we've done to our environment. And this one talks about how do we actually start fixing some things up here? How do we make that better? Again, if you've had those conversations and you feel that they're well into- We live. Necessarily need to go there. There are four R's that are focused on in grade two. So that would be important for you to know in grade three. So they add the repurposing to the mix, right? And so instead of just chucking out this bag, is there something I could repurpose the bag for and turn it into something that's usable rather than throwing it out? So again, I've given you some, some videos that you can use there if you want. We live. Uh, just a conversation slide. I won't go through that one because I want to get into this one. So in grade three, we're, we're still looking at how do we keep a, a safe environment, but we're talking through the lens of respect and interdependency. How do we respect? What does it mean to be respectful interactions? What does that mean? It, does it mean that I stay on trails? And often they hear that people say, don't walk on the grass. Don't walk here. Why are they saying that? What is the purpose behind the sign? What was the intent of that? What does being respectful interaction mean? It means I don't take more than I need. I don't just cut every tree down, but I only needed one, right? It's, it's having that comment. So we have to make sure that that language is understood. And in here, these would be all different kinds of respectful interactions that take place. And these are just samples, right? There's lots more that you can dive into. But every one of these is linked that you can go in um, it talks about why do we put signs up that say stay on trails? Why? Who cares? If I'm going in the mountains, who cares where I walk? What's the difference? 
um, preserving nature, farming practices. You know, if we're coming from a farming community, what are some farming patterns that we put into place that help with conservation of soil and enrich the soil? Again, our kids will come at it from different perspectives. This one I put outside just, and I'm putting a note here just to be a little bit careful. Fishing and hunting, those are also ways that we conserve, right? We, we have rules about hunting, we have rules about fishing. And why should we even follow those rules? But you also have to be careful about, uh, the question is, can they contribute to conservation? There are gonna be some children who have been brought up that if you shoot an animal, you're a bad person, right? They, there is no hunting. So just be cognizant that you need to know your group and maybe their backgrounds a little bit about what's gonna come up. It doesn't mean you can't talk about it, but you just be ready for that conversation um, because some people just, there is no killing of animals, period. It doesn't matter what the animal is, right? So just be a little bit careful with, with that topic. If we talk about how do we ensure that we are reducing our, our footprint and that we give animals opportunity. We've infringed on their land. We build our roads, we build our houses, but how do we help those animals still have a normal life? So I just gave them some quick pictures of the, the walk animal walkways or what they're called. They have them in Banff, right? So you can go down, you could drive all the way to BC, you'd go under these. So the animals just walk over, they're fully grass, they're fully got trees on them. And, and the animals can just go from one side of the highway to the other, why? because they keep running into cars where there were no places for them to travel, right? They, that was a protection. So we're trying to maintain their opportunities. Um, we're looking at places like underground culverts. Instead of going over the ground, they went underground so that the animals can walk under the highways and still get from point A to point B. And along here, when we look at the highways, all of these fence lines have super high eight foot fences on them to ensure that when I cross over as an animal, I'm still behind a fence, so I'm not likely to run across the, the highway. So just again, some ideas in, in case you're looking for things. We put signage up, right, to give people, heads up people, we're in a world where this kind of an animal might be seen. Um, you know, we see caribou crossing signs, although you don't see caribou crossing a highway very often, but there are places that you can go. Moose, deer, we see those a lot, right? It's a heads up. Those are preventative types of things that we're trying to do to make people aware that slow down. This is their world they live in, not our world, right? We're the ones who jumped into theirs. So again, when we talk about how do we help even with tracking and counting, who cares how many animals there are? Why do they even take on projects to look after counting of animals? And so I gave you some, some samples from Alberta that are happening right now and continue. So the grizzly study for one, um, the caribou ones. I used to live out in Hinton. I was principal out there for 15 years. And there's a caribou hood, just caribou herd outside of Hinton, which has been tracked for years. And to see them, I only saw them once in 15 years, but there's a lot of work that's going into trying to maintain their life because they're such a small dwindling population right now. Um, science and conservation, maybe you've got children who don't really care about these two animals, but they want to get into protecting species, or they're into fishing, or they heard that bison have been released out of Banff and they're running wild, right? So this link here will give you all kinds. There's probably 50 choices that the kids could look at. So again, they don't have to just stick to one topic. And that's kind of the approach I like to go is that maybe we can get them more hooked into the conversation if they can find one that they're interested in as well. Grizzly bear population. Okay, and then again, we talk about Mother Earth, that connection for First Nations. How do they view all of this, right? It doesn't mean that they don't harvest from the land, but they have very distinct ways that they harvest animals. They have very different ways of harvesting fish. And what is that process? And is that a process that, um, that they give something back? And they do. If, if I'm going to take water from the river, I'm gonna bless it with tobacco first, and then I'm going to draw. And if I'm gonna take the, what they call brown water, the water that you find in bogs that they make tea out of, which is very healthy tea, they're going to bless that with tobacco first, right? So it's the practice of recognizing that mother earth sustains me. I have to thank her and give her back again. And that's really important that we tie that in throughout our teaching, not just in the end. And I know it's at the end of my slide deck, but not just, it's not incidental. It's not something that we just throw in because, oh yeah, we got to put in the First Nations link. It should be throughout as we go through things. 
So in here, and, and some of you may have already seen this, um, BC has done a lot more work in some of the resources they put forward for teachers. So there is a definitely strong pull to BC in here, but most of this is still referenced at Alberta as well. This is a 285 page document. And I'm just going to tell you which pages that you could look at where it unpacks what is the Indigenous view in science? How do they see us teaching science? And they talk about Mother Earth and they talk about some activities, like, for example, they'll say, take your children outside and here's an activity that we would do to take them outside. So this, you can download the whole thing. There's no copyright that you have to worry about here. Pointed out yesterday to the group that there's also um, from uh, Carrie Ann Reed, she'll look after the, the story of Mother Earth, which is a great book. It ties in Mother Earth's garden, which is not a garden as we're Makes thinking, sense. it's garden as in Mother Earth and all the things that are encountered in there. The same thing here, if you want a little bit of, of enhancement with the children and how do we understand the values and beliefs of Mother Earth, any one of these will help you out. Um, you can watch them. I would suggest you always watch them first to see if they match with the cultural beliefs in your area. If not, bring in a knowledge keeper, bring in an elder. Um, and a lot of them will do Zoom now. Like, they don't have to be in your classroom. They will, if you tell them upfront and you offer them tobacco, do the protocol, they will still do it on Zoom. So we, could, we can still have them into our classroom and they can tell us the story of Mother Earth from their perspective. Okay. I've given you sort of a summing up template. These are editable. So you could go in and use them if you want. I, you could use them as a sum up, you could use them or ignore them. I mean, whatever, whatever works for you, they'll be in your folder. And then we've also provided you with a rubric. If you were looking for a sort of a science rubric that you could consistently use throughout your use in the pilot series as we go through, this is one that comes from BC and they use it for science and technology. And it's, it's a three page document. It's a great tool. It gives you lots of ways that we can assess where children are at, at the different components and their components fit very close to what ours are. So it's a, it's a nice match right now to what we're doing. So that's just a slide deck of ideas. It's not, it kind of covers everything, but it doesn't mean that you wouldn't dig deeper down into different areas. And again, as I said, you are more than welcome. You will get that slide deck. It will be in your folders. So let's talk a little bit about what we have. Um, all the recordings, all of the handouts that we have for you will be put into that movingforwardcurriculum.ca, the one that you log into. You go in the cohort, go into science grade three, and that's where you'll find all of your resources. So we'll put everything in there. Our next date, oh, I changed that. How come it didn't save? Our next one is November 7th, not November 2nd. Uh, and we'll be looking at matter on that one. If you have things that you're willing to share, send them to me and I will post them. I will post them into your folder as a shared folder. And then you can go in and see what other people have got that you can grab from the light work with many hands makes it a lot easier for, for you. The other piece is that we wanted to mention that we have been working with Gizmos. We, we met with them this morning. And we are asking them to start going through their resources to see what links directly to each of the organizing ideas in each of the grades. So that will be coming soon. However, in order to do that and for you to have access to them, some of you may have already done something with Gizmos. There are awareness sessions. Awareness sessions are things where you get your login if you haven't already done that you find your way how to navigate the site. That's what the awareness sessions that they advertise through CARC or ELC are about. We have asked them to put some awareness sessions in October. They're gonna try and do them on Tuesdays and Thursdays after schools, and then you can just pick any one of the days would be fine. They're gonna do multiple times. Um, if you've already got the login, you already know how to go through it, the one date we would like you to make sure that you have on your calendar, and they're not gonna go through the logins and whatever, they're gonna assume you have them. On October 26th at 3.45 to five o'clock, we're gonna do it just for the science pilot teachers. So they're going to bring forward the pieces that we want to look at. So that's a night that's reserved just for you guys, not for anybody else to come in. So you might wanna, and this will be on, on the recording. So you can always, if you forget the date, don't worry, you'll, you'll get to see it. One of the other things I'm just gonna throw into the chat box, and I gotta get out of this slide deck here is some of people have been asking about coding. 
Coding is what we're going to do on October 26. That's our focus. We're going to get you started in coding specifically for science. Uh, and we want to kind of get those pieces started for you so that you feel comfortable. And it's a day for the teachers. It's not about, I got to teach this next day to the kids. This is about you feeling comfortable and getting through the coding piece if you haven't already done it. If you're away on it, don't worry about the day, then don't come. What I just put into the chat box is a link. There is an offer of um, a, a group that right now will take any teacher's classes. They'll sign up the whole class and they'll work through a, a coding opportunity with you and the students. You would learn alongside with your kids. You can find out more information on that site. I don't know a ton about it, but just check it out if it's something you're interested in. Um, but we're gonna do that on the 26th so that you are um, more or less ready to roll and, and good to go from there. Okay, so that is it. I hope that that gives you a good starting point. I hope that gives you at least a comfort level that you have a place to get going and, and feel comfortable with some of the topics that you might encounter. Um, 